why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're excited to be kicking off this uh, new uh, series of lectures. Um, and so I wanted to start by, uh, before introducing our speaker today, Maya, um, start by just giving you all an introduction to what CORS is all about, um, and then, um, then jump right into the talk. So, you know, we're really lucky here at Stanford to have uh, researchers who are really amongst the world's leaders on the issues of open science and reproducibility. Really, you know, th these are just a few of the people on campus who've been involved in various aspects of this kind of activity, really spanning, you know, from the law school to the med school to the philosophy department to the engineering school, computer science, really all over the place. Um, and so, you know, you would you would hope that Stanford would be a place where you know we could really sort of bring everybody on board with using the kind of practices that we know to you know sort of lead to better and more open science. But what we've seen is that you know early career researchers and trainees still really struggle to adopt these practices, um, both open science and reproducible research practices. Um, and so we we really started cores with the goal of sort of you know, taking what we've learned you know, in many different fields about how to do open and, and reproducible science and really try to make the, the, the methods accessible to researchers across campus and really try to help build a community of researchers. Because we know that you know, the best way to learn how to do these things is to work with other people. And so th that's the, the goal of CORES. And one of the, you know, one of the, the sort of drivers behind this is this idea of open science by design. Several years ago, the National Academies put together a report that they titled Open Science by Design and, um, and really sort of laid out you know, a set of ideas for how to design how research institutions work um, so that Science, you know, we, we don't have to call it open science anymore, reproducible science. We can just call it science because that's how everybody will do science. Um, and so our goal is to, you know, to start here at Stanford, making that happen, but then ultimately, you know, take what we learn here and and sort of, you know, bring it out to the rest of the world. So the the these are the people who sort of got core started. Um, I, along with uh, Maya, are the, uh, the the two people who run the center. Um, Franklin Feingold is our associate director and has really done an amazing job of putting together this uh, particular series. And so we should uh, we should give him a hand for for all of his work on this. Um, and then we have an executive committee of you know researchers from across campus, uh, including a number of people from the libraries and the dean of research office. You know, who've really been instrumental in helping us think through how to, you know, how to go about achieving our goals. So we are um, we're supported by uh, an organization called Stanford Data Science, which is a group on campus as part of um, Stanford's Long Range Vision, which was a an effort undertaken by the president a couple of years ago to figure out basically what are the big challenges that we want to try to solve, you know, in the next decade or two, um, and data science turned out to be one of those things that everybody sort of agreed, you know, we have to, uh, we, we have to address and sort of push forward in order to, to improve science. Um, and so Stanford Data Science is funding a number of different initiatives and centers. We're one of the first two centers, the other being the Stanford Causal Science Center. Um, it's also funded other programs such as Data Science for Social Good and Women in Data Science. Um, and, and so they're really sort of, you know, behind the, the efforts that, that we've been making. Um, we have a set of values that, you know, we've tried to follow in everything that we do. Those include, you know, kind of obviously transparency and openness. Um, we think everything should be shared as openly as possible. Reproducibility, you know, we think that we need to prioritize rigor and reproducibility, even when it conflicts with other considerations or incentives. Diversity inclusion, we really want the, the, the process to be open and all open to all, and we want our community to be as broad as possible. And community mindedness. We think science science should not be a, a competitive sport. It should be a game in which we all cooperate and coordinate. We have three areas of focus. One is open science. Um, one is reproducibility, and you know, today is going to be one of the talks that really focuses on reproducibility. Um, and the other is evidence synthesis, you know, sort of bringing data together from, from multiple sources to try to figure out what we can know. And that's a particular um, area of expertise for, for Maya. 
Um, we gave out a, a, a set of awards earlier this year to try to incentivize people on campus who are engaged in open science activities. Um, two of them went to establish faculty members who've engaged in various activities or, around open science. And two went to what we call innovators, uh, both of them graduate students um, who've been sort of pushing on open science practices and ideas, you know, even as, as trainees. Um, we're currently working on a, a guide that we'll be making available either later this year or early next year. Um, we call the Open by Design Guide, which is really meant to help provide researchers with, um, you know, with, with everything they need to get started doing open science and with a set of examples from many different areas of science um, so that researchers here at Stanford can and, and elsewhere can look at this guide and see, you know, here's an example of a paper from my field of research that has used particular open science or reproducible research components um, and can sort of really see how it happens in action and then also be able to, you know, sort of reach out to those investigators if they need help sort of implementing that. I think you're all, you've all seen the, the schedule for the upcoming lecture series, but really excited about the set of people that we have. We have a set of kind of four topics and each topic will have a conceptual lecture that kind of introduces the concepts and then a practical lecture that really shows how, kind of how to do it in a hands-on way. So um, so we'll be starting with reproducible analysis today. Um, Maya Mather is going to be giving the conceptual lecture. Um, and I just want to end by saying if you're interested in getting engaged or becoming an affiliate of CORES, um, you can contact us at openscience.stanford.edu and um, we're happy to uh, to try to engage you however we can. So now I want to introduce Maya. Um, Maya Mather is an assistant professor in um, the Quantitative Sciences Unit uh, here in the medical school at Stanford um, and is a, an expert in um, you know, many aspects of data analysis and reproducibility. Um, and in particular has been focused in the last few years on sort of understanding the nature of reproducibility in, um, you know, in published research, um, as well as, you know, having a deep interest in uh, uh, meta analysis and sort of how to, you know, synthesize evidence across studies. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Maya. Let me do a slideshow. All right. Are you seeing the slides now? I can see them. Okay, great. Let's do one more slide and one more slide. Okay, so what I was just saying was that um, although we kind of typically think of reproducible data analysis as kind of this altruistic investment in the scientific ecosystem, which indeed it is, I think it's also important to realize that it's also a great investment in your own future sanity. Slide. So I'm going to talk today about five kind of high level principles of reproducible data analysis. First, to do everything programmatically, which we'll see basically means replacing kind of manual operations on your data with doing those same things in code that is much more traceable. Second, to document code and data sets. Third, to use version control fourth to modularize code, and fifth to use a reproducible software environment. Slide. Um, my, I gave you control on my screen. Can you try uh, actually going forward, see if that works? Uh, use the arrow key. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Clever. There you go. Okay. So these five principles aren't exhaustive, but I do think they're a good starting point for a lot of types of data projects and disciplines. And as I walk through these, I'm gonna to try to show and illustrate how each of these principles can help prevent common data analysis woes that we all have encountered. And you kind of can choose your own adventure in terms of how deeply to implement each of these principles. Um, I've structured them kind of from top to bottom as in what I see as kind of an approximate ordering from principles that are sort of the most central and the easiest to learn to the ones that are typically gonna be more icing on the cake and useful to learn, but maybe a little bit uh, something you might postpone until you feel more comfortable with the first steps. That ordering of course is gonna depend on the discipline that you work on and the type of projects. But one way forward, if you feel like you're just getting your feet wet is to start with the earlier principles. And then, Within each of these principles as well, you could implement it in kind of more of a bare bones way that just gets kind of a simple version of that principle implemented. 
or a really fancy sophisticated way or really anything in between. And so throughout this talk, I'm gonna be showing you um, often examples that are kind of somewhere different places on the spectrum of how, how, how detailed of an implementation is, is being done. But just remember that if you're just getting started and you feel a little bit intimidated by these principles, just it's, it's better to do kind of a bare bones version than nothing at all. So you might as well get your feet wet. That's how we all learn. And you can always make it more sophisticated down the road. Okay, so our first principle is to do everything programmatically. So here are some common data analysis woes. So first, you're reading back through your manuscript that you submitted six months ago, and you see a p-value on line 456. Where did that come from? Which of the you know, 50 models we fit and all of these lines of code, where, where did we get this from? Uh, we can't, can't answer reviewer number two until we remember how we got that. Second common woe, uh, you go back to your data set and there's some composite variable in there that you know you calculated when you cleaned the data, but you don't remember how. Was it a mean? Was it a median? How did you actually make that variable? So the idea of doing everything programmatically can try to help with these types of problems. And what I mean by that is to use what's called a command language rather than manual calculations or point and click softwares to clean and analyze data. Okay, what do I mean by that? So on the left here is an example of what's called a point and click language. Um, this is SPSS. I'm gonna be picking on SPSS today, but there's plenty of other uh, similar softwares that, that, you could, um, that you can pick on. And this is an example of just creating a new variable that is calculated based on two existing ones in the data set. And the way that this, this happens is you kind of click through a series of menu items and you have to kind of type in like the formula you want to use and then finally you get the new variable in your data set. If you wanted to reproduce this as an independent researcher or just down the road for your own analyses, what you would need to do is go through the same sort of physical steps of clicking through menu items and dragging things around in the windows. Um, you would have to guess at what that sequence of steps was and get it correct if you wanted to arrive at the same answer. In contrast, on the right-hand side is an example of a command language. This is R. Um, and what a command language does differently is that instead of having you go through a menu of items to choose from, you're actually writing simple lines of code that accomplish the same thing, but they specify in a unique and fully traceable way what operations are being done. So this is an example of similarly kind of making a new variable, which is just the mean of two other variables in the data set. If I wanted to reproduce this analysis in contrast to the SPSS version, all I would have to do is basically highlight these three lines of code and click run. And I would get the same answer um, without having to guess at any mysterious steps that happen in between. Um, here's another example. So this is a data analysis, regression in a point and click language versus in a command language. And so similarly, if you wanted to do a regression in SPSS, you would be kind of choosing which variables to drag into this window. You'd have to choose certain options for the regression. Um, and if you didn't do all of those steps in exactly the same way, you might get a different result. None of that, again, is traceable when all you have is just the SPSS file. In contrast, in R or another command language, you have kind of essentially one line in this case that runs the regression. And the results of the regression are gonna be the same as long as you just run the single line. And so you know you're gonna get the same result. Um, there are many command languages out there for statistical analyses, just to name a few that are popular. Um, R is kind of a well-known kind of useful default option. It's freely available, which is nice. SAS is very common in medicine. Um, Python is, is getting increasingly popular. MATLAB is common in psychology and many, many, many more. So you really have your choice based on your discipline. Um, some languages also have both point and click and command-based options. Um, 
that can be one way to learn. So some people like to um, kind of have the, go through the point and click operations, have the language generate some syntax, which it will do automatically, and then maybe modify that syntax or use the syntax as a learning point. So that's, that's one way you can kind of make the transition if you're used to point and click languages. Uh, just to kind of home in on one language in particular that I think is kind of one of the most useful and sort of discipline agnostic, um, just wanted to point out a few good resources for learning R. Um, so resources to teach yourself. Uh, there's a really nice kind of self-paced um, intro to R class that I really like that has uh, lecture videos along with exercises and labs. Um, Quick R is a website that's really nice for giving you kind of uh, bite-sized modules about how to carry out common analyses or tasks. Uh, there are countless online tutorials. So I've linked to one website that uh, will give you kind of a, a list of tutorials you could, you could do. Um, and my favorite book is called The Art of R Programming, which is um, a very accessible kind of introduction to thinking about how you interact with data using a command language. There's also structured classes available um, that are free. There are two Coursera courses that I'm aware of. Uh, there's a nice list of classes at Stanford that use or teach R. And there are also workshops at Stanford through a group called the Carpentries. Um, and this is actually not specific to R, but they also will teach other command languages as well. So that's a great resource to try out if you wanna try to learn something like this. Uh, good places to ask questions, um, kind of the the, the best place probably to ask any software related question is a website called Stack Overflow, um, which is essentially kind of a place where people can post questions and get uh, usually quite, quite helpful and detailed answers from other users. Um, and it's also just a really good kind of treasure trove of questions that have already been asked and answered. So I definitely encourage using resources like that um, when you're running into difficulties. There's also a sort of an office hours at Stanford specific to R that I, I don't know all that much about it, but it seems like an interesting resource to check out. As I said at the beginning, um, you can download the slides where all of these links will be clickable. So the second principle that I wanted to highlight is the idea of documenting code and data sets. So uh, some more common data analysis woes. Um, you've got your figure two in your manuscript and you have to update it, but you have multiple different R scripts or you know what R scripts in whatever language, which one of them actually has the code you need for that figure. Um, you might have to dig through for quite a while to find it. Or maybe you wrote some really detailed code to do some data cleaning or data prep six months ago. Um, and now you're reading through your code line by line and you can't really remember what it's doing. So now you're gonna have to like go to Google and try to figure out what that code is actually doing. Or maybe, you know, again, you find some composite variable in the prep data set and you just don't really remember exactly how you created it. So you're gonna have to go dig through the whole, the whole, the whole part of the data prep code to actually figure out what that variable is because you don't have a central description of what's in your data set. So these kinds of things can be quite time consuming. So um, a good solution is documenting code and data sets, which basically means explaining their contents in prose in a way that's easy to understand for a human. And there are multiple kind of levels of granularity at which you can do this. So one is um, it's helpful to have uh, sort of a readme file that goes with whatever collection you have of files for your project. So preferably some kind of public online repository um, that has you know, your data set, your code files, your questionnaire materials, um, whatever else is associated with your project. And a readme file is kind of the, um, it's just like a master file that kind of explains everything that's in that location. It tells users kind of what are the most important files if you wanna do a certain thing, like reproduce a certain analysis. Um, it's also helpful to accompany any data sets that are used in analysis with codebooks. And we'll see that codebooks basically explain what the variables are that are in that data set. Finest grain level is that within code files, it's incredibly useful to use line by line comments, which, which are essentially little snippets of prose that are in a code file. So they're not actually code, they're not being interpreted by the computer, but they just explain um, just to a human what the code is actually doing. 
this parenthetically is another reason that it's really useful to use a command language because you actually can have a code that's interspersed with comments as opposed to just, you know, you have your SPSS file and it's, you've, or you save the output with no kind of human intelligible um, comments. So here are just two examples of ways you might choose to structure a readme file. On the left is kind of the simplest possible readme file for a really tiny analysis. And on the right is a part of a much more complicated readme file. So the, the left readme file is essentially just kind of telling the user like what, what you would need to know in terms of the files in the directory if you wanted to reproduce a very small analysis in the paper. So it's just saying, Okay, we've got kind of two R scripts. They're called analyze.r and helper.r. So we're going to need to go get those files. Um, and then there's a data set called kodama prepped.csv. Very, very simple, just telling people a map of what files are there. Um, a lot of projects are much more complicated, right? There could be many different steps of data analysis that need to be conducted. And then it's useful to kind of document what steps need to be done um, and what the job of different files is. So this was kind of a fairly complicated meta-analysis where you, know, you had to go through multiple steps. First, you had to prep a certain data set of subjective ratings, then you had to prep another data set, then you needed to kind of calculate effect sizes. And so the readme file is just kind of taking the reader through what these different files mean. Um, Codebooks are also called data dictionaries, and these are files that explain what each variable in a data set means and also the values that it can assume. So, for example, um, it's very useful, especially if you have, you know, a variable like gender or something. Hopefully, it's not coded one, two, but that's not a very, you know, that's not very transparent, right? So, you want to have a column that actually tells you what that variable means. Again, hopefully, the variable itself is not coded one, two, because that's not clear. Um, but something such that if you gave someone the data set and the code book, they could do a different analysis, for example, because they actually would understand what those variables mean. This is in contrast to having to dig back through your code or even worse, try to dig back through your memory of what point and click you did and your point and click language to try to remember how you constructed some variable that was a composite or derived from the original data. Um, finally, I mentioned line by line comments in code. So here's just a little example of me doing some data prep. I was just making, it's very straightforward, just making a variable in the data set that has something to do with kind of votes to a major party candidate. Um, imagine what this would be like if I didn't have these green English prose snippets in here. I mean, what is going on here? Look how long this is, like what could this possibly mean? Um, I myself, if I were reading back through a code that I wrote, you know, only six months ago and I didn't have these comments, I would probably be, you know, take me a minute to kind of understand what was going on. But this is very clear. I can say, all right, you know, these are just sanity checks so I can kind of ignore them. This is really where the hard work is being done. So um, just having code that kind of walks the reader through in prose is very, very useful. Um, third principle is to use version control. So here are some common headaches. Um, you go to rerun your code and it's breaking. You're getting some error message, probably one of the really cryptic ones, and you don't know what's going on. You're sure the code ran fine earlier. What could have happened? Or maybe you rerun the code and you get a different numerical result from what you reported before. You go back to your manuscript and you go back to your code and you're not sure like something changed, but you're not sure what. So how can we try to prevent these issues? Um, so version control is a way to try to save and label successive versions of a file in a way that clearly tracks what parts of that file changed and why. This is a sort of much more sophisticated version of saving your file as v1, changing it, saving it as v2, changing it, saving it as v3. We've all seen that, the meme with the many, many file versions. Um, version control is a way to do that that is, is much more precise and sort of traceable about what the changes were. There are actually a few different, actually many different options for version control softwares, but I think by far the most popular is something called Git, um, which has a nice kind of online interface called GitHub. So let's see what that looks like. 
So these types of version control essentially work by letting you, you're working on your file and you can use the version control software to essentially kind of snapshot that file at any point in time. And in making that snapshot to use what's called a commit message to explain again in prose what you changed. So here's an example of some history from a project I was working on. Um, I was like deep in the weeds with doing analyses and you can see that I can look at my history, like what did I do on June 27th, 2021? Well, I did you know, each of these things and I left myself notes about what had changed each time. Um, this is a great alibi in case I ever am on a murder trial. It's like, what was I doing on June 27th? I was building CC analysis straight into the existing MI script. There you go. Um, but this is very helpful because if I were to click on one of these commits, for example, I would actually be taken back in time to what the files looked like during that, during that point in time. Um, and so here's an example of what would happen if I clicked on a specific commit. So this is, I was sort of generalizing some data prep code to handle multiple studies. Okay, whatever. But if I click on this, what's cool is I get taken to a screen that's called the diff. Um, it's essentially the difference between what my file or files looked like before versus after that commit. So on the left is kind of what my code was like before I did this step of generalization and on the right is after. And the color coding is telling me, okay, exactly what I did was I took this red line of code, which is just kind of pretty simple. And then I generalized it. So I got some additional code. I replaced it with the code in green. So this is like super easy for me to understand what I did if I were to go back to this, this screen. Um, okay, recent story, uh, Git has many times saved me like countless hours of stress and frustration. Um, this was a situation where uh, we were doing a study that had, a, doing, a, doing, doing an experiment that had kind of multiple sub-studies, the three sub-studies. We did study one uh, that was back at the end of 2020. And then we had to go collect more data for studies two and three. Um, while we were waiting for that to happen, we analyzed study one and we, you know, we saved our code. We get to the end with study three, you know, maybe six months have gone by and we decide, okay, let's just rerun all the code for everything just to make sure it's all, you know, synchronized and good to go. And lo and behold, the results we had gotten previously for study one did not look the same when we reran the code six months later. What could it possibly be? The regression coefficients were different. It could be the data prep went differently. It could be some early step in the analysis went differently. Who knows? It could have been so many different things. Um, so then we had to figure out what was different. Well, Git came to the rescue because we knew we were able to go back to the exact history of what was happening right around the time that we wrote that previous version of the manuscript where we knew what the results were. So we were able to go in and say, oh, look at this. Okay, I was having trouble with this particular type of analysis. Here's me being frustrated about the analysis. And then we, we had to change something to make it work for the other studies. So long story short, it was a way to just jump back in time to what the code files were like at at the point where we knew they changed and I was able to figure out what happened in just a few minutes and very, very happy that we were able to do that. Um, going back to that point I made earlier about um, kind of an, an investment in your future sanity, um, I think a recurring message is that a lot of times using reproducible data analysis principles um, feels kind of time consuming when you're actually doing them, but then down the road end up saving you a lot of time and kind of recouping the, the time that they took. Um, in this case, for example, I mean, yeah, it took me a little more time to kind of make all these commit messages, these little comments to myself as I was doing the data analysis. It took a little more time than just writing the code file without version control. But it really repaid for itself. It really repaid its, its losses, I think, many fold um, when instead of taking days or weeks or forever for me to figure out what the, what the error was, it, you know, it only took me 10 minutes because I could just look at the history. Um, lots of great resources for learning Git and GitHub are out there. Um, I included a link to, again, kind of a list of different tutorials and different levels of difficulty. Um, there are structured free classes on Udemy. Um, Stanford IT has a workshop. Um, again, uh, Stack Overflow is like your hero for kind of figuring out questions or answers to specific problems for software.
fourth thing I want to talk about is the idea of modularizing code. Okay, so here are some more data analysis headaches. Uh, you run like a big kind of for loop of code that's doing a bunch of analyses and you get some error message. It's really cryptic. Um, where is it coming from? Uh, which step in the analysis is giving us this error message? Or um, another version is maybe you have some analysis that uh, you're doing repeatedly in your, in, your, um, in your analysis. You have to fit a regression model or something. Um, but then you realize you have to change something about all of those. You go back to your pre-registration and you remember that you were supposed to use robust standard errors or something. So now you have to go through all of those regressions and edit them all and try to keep them all synchronized and it takes a really long time. Well, modularizing code is a way to deal with these problems and it means trying to split complicated tasks into small pieces, um, each of which gets done in a standalone way. And code can be modularized at a few different levels. So one way is to have uh, to modularize the scripts themselves. So I like to have kind of a separate script that does data prep from the one that does data analysis. And that way um, I can sort of run the data prep script. Its only job is to clean up the data set, you know, do any exclusions it needs to do, calculate any composite variables, whatever, do any sanity checks on the way that, you know, the way the data look. And end product is it saves the data set that is ready to analyze. That's it, it doesn't do any analyses. And then the analysis script takes that nice clean data set and does analyses. That's its only job. It doesn't modify the data set. It doesn't add variables, whatever. And so this is a good way to kind of factor your project into discrete chunks, each of which can be dealt with and examined separately. Also, you can modularize within a script by writing functions for tasks that need to be done repeatedly. So let's see an example of that. So here's an example of, um, you know, I had this, I had like a, a fantasy of what I wanted my table one to look like. It was like my perfect table one. It was gonna have the number of studies. This was a meta analysis and the percent. Um, and then it was gonna have the number that didn't report a characteristic on another row. And for continuous variables, I wanted the median and the first and third quartiles. And this is a common thing to have to do, right? You have some specific idea of you, you want to have this like constructed table or analysis and kind of a, a just, you want it just like you want it. And so it wouldn't be that hard, right? To just make this table manually, right? I could just kind of for each of these variables, I could just calculate the number and the percent and the medians and just type it into my table. That would probably take 10 minutes. Um, a modularized version of doing this could look something as follows. So this is a function that I wrote whose only job is to make one row of this table. So I'm just kind of outsourcing this job of making one table row to a function. And the function, I give it the variable I want to summarize, and I give it some information about kind of, you know, is it continuous or, or categorical, and it spits out just one row of the table. And then when I actually run my analysis code, I don't have to do the same operations over and over of getting medians for all these different variables and rounding them and formatting them nicely. All I have to do is just repeatedly call this function whose only job is to add a row to the table. So that's an example of just kind of modularizing the task of making this table into a function. Okay, so that looks like a whole lot of work to make a table one. Why would I subject myself to that? Um, so similarly to what I said for Git, I mean, this is a situation where, yeah, it, it does take more time than just typing the results straight into the table at the outset. But I think it really often saves you time down the road. Why? Well, say I need to kind of add a new variable to the table. Well, that's trivially easy because I can just run the function I already had. Or even worse, what if I make a little update to the data set? Oh, this one study had to be excluded, we forgot. Well, now I don't have to retype my whole table, um, risking that I'll forget, you know, forgot to update one of the numbers. I can just rerun the code that I already had um, because I have it modularized into its own function. Or, you know, say I need to change the way we report each variable. I decide I want ranges instead of quartiles. Well, I don't have to go through and change 
what I do for 10 different variables, I can just change that one function whose only job is to make a table row and then I can easily update the whole table. Or I wanna write another paper and I still want something just like the dream table. Well, that's even easier because I can just use the function that I already had, which has a job that can be done over and over. So long story short, I think that doing this exercise actually saved me time down the road. Uh, one final example of code modularization. Um, here's an example of how you might do it for an analysis. So let's say uh, you want to fit a regression model and um, you have some pickiness about how this is done, right? Maybe you want, I want robust standard errors and I want it to report standardized mean differences and I want it to report the coefficients and the p-values and the confidence intervals in a nice way that looks good. So instead of running your regression over and over and over for, you know, 15 different analyses and um, just having this massive output, uh, you could modularize the task of running your regression just like you like it into a function. So I have this function and its only job is to run the regression just like I like it and report it just like I like it. Very, very easy for me to um, extend this or use it for another context. Okay, final principle I wanna talk about is reproducible software environments. Um, common problems. Oh, the R package got updated while our manuscript was under review and now we're getting different results. Or, um, or similarly, you, uh, you realize that you know, some, something about your software has changed and it's, it's giving you something different. Um, a software environment is essentially all of the software specifics, like for example, packages for, um, for that will do different analyses that were present when you did your data analyses. And a reproducible software environment is one that can be saved and reinstated at any time. And so it's kind of like going back in time to how the software was when you did the analyses, even if that was no longer the most current version. Um, so there's multiple tools out there to create a reproducible environment, just to name a couple. Um, there's a very straightforward option in R, it's something called RENV, um, reproducible environment. Super easy to use, it basically saves snapshots of the software version you were working with, as well as any optionally loaded packages. And then if you want to jump back in time to how those things were when you analyze the data, it's just like a one line kind of just take me back in time and it will just take you back to that, that scenario. Um, a much more kind of complicated and fancy option is something called Docker, works for any programming language. And what it does is it makes what's called a container, which is almost like another operating system on your machine. Um, it's a little bit the same idea of a virtual machine. So if any of you have, let's say, run Windows on a Mac, um, you are using a virtual machine, very similar idea. Um, and that container could be running totally different software specifications, could even be a different operating system. And that's a fancy way to go if you want to kind of have a more complicated workflow. So to summarize, um, the five principles we discussed are doing everything programmatically, documenting code and data sets, using version control, modularizing code, and using a reproducible software environment. I mostly showed you examples from my own favorite workflow, which kind of works for the discipline and projects I do. I like to use R, I like to use Git, I like to use Open Science Framework. But the reason I wanted to discuss these principles in the abstract, as I did, was that there are many other means to the same end of reproducible data analysis. You could achieve uh, documenting code and data sets with totally different tools than what I like to use. Um, and so you, know, you can certainly customize this workflow to what makes sense for you. Um, and there was also a recurring theme that I want to underscore that even though reproducible data analysis often does take more time to set up at the outset, I think it very often more than pays for itself down the road when you save yourself time and headaches um, in the future. Um, so coming up next, um, today I talked about these principles at a high level in the abstract, but what we'll be doing with these course lectures is actually alternating between these kind of higher level, more abstract talks 
with ones that are much more hands-on and practical. So coming up on October 7th, um, you'll get a talk that will actually take you through the nitty gritty of how to implement these practices. Um, so that's that's the material I wanted to cover. Um, again, there's a link to download the slides here. Um, would be great if you don't mind providing some feedback on this talk. It takes like two minutes as we do pay attention to it. So that would be very helpful. Um, and I would be very happy to take any questions, comments, um, other ideas. And feel free to either um, just unmute yourself or you, know, you can type it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Um, okay, so one question I see, where do we get the info about Git Workshop? Um, I would recommend downloading the slide deck using the link that's in the chat um, and you will be able to click on that uh, and all the other links. There's one in the Q&A, any idea for naming variables or functions? Oh, I love that question. Yeah, so there's kind of many, everyone has their own favorite approach. Um, yeah, so I, I think the, the general recommendation is to have a consistent system and stick with it. And if you have multiple people in your team to kind of synchronize your coding style so that you're all using the same conventions. Um, some teams like to build their practices on some kind of existing style guide. So like Google has one, for example, um, that's certainly one way to go. Um, so it, it's, it's not so much about how you do it as having a consistent system. So for me, for example, this is, this is just my own, my own convention, but I like to use underscores for functions. Um, and I like to use kind of what's called camel case for variables, which is where you have the, you don't have spaces and instead you have uh, sort of capitals for the, the beginnings of words. That's just me. It makes it easy for me to know if something is a function or a variable, for example. Do I have suggestions um, for how to- Sorry, before you go on to that, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna paste a link to a book in the chat, which I think it does a really nice job of, of addressing some of these issues. It's called The Art of Readable Code. It's like a fairly digestible book that does a really good job of this. Awesome, thanks Russ. Do you have suggestions for how to onboard collaborators who are new to these tools and help a team become consistent? Maybe a checklist. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so part of what we're hoping to do with kind of these, um, this upcoming uh, open by design guide is to kind of provide tools that will help address that. So kind of a, a, um, a set of ideas or um, principles that you might be able to follow in your team to, to try to do this. Um, it seems like there's kind of different different ways. I mean, one is kind of to have like the PI sort of set up the system and then train people in it. Um, often it happens the other way around where trainees will kind of initiate um, and, and develop a system amongst themselves. Um, but yeah, I, th I think kind of synchronizing practices across the team early on is probably the most key portion. Um, I took a Python course from Rice, but I'm confused what to proceed next. I'm working in biomedical science field. Do you know any forum discussing on the intersection between data science and medicine? Um, nothing comes specifically to my mind on the Python front. Um, maybe Russ or Franklin, do you have any recommendations for this individual? I don't, yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know offhand. Um, you know, there's a lot of, Certainly, like in the the kind of machine learning space, you know, there's a lot of stuff around like medical imaging and sort of Python resources for that. So there's you know packages like Scikit-Learn or Scikit-Image stuff like that. Um, in terms of like specific forum, I I'm not familiar with anything. Um, you know, the Stack Overflow seems to be the place that everybody goes for these types of things, so that's usually my first go-to. Maybe one question that often comes up um, that maybe you can kind of speak to is like, what, you know, how do you decide when to commit something to version control? Oh, yeah, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, I think there's probably different workflows and, and kind of principles for how to do that. Um, I guess I try to do it when I feel like, I, okay, so I guess committing, for me, committing too often would be committing something that is um, kind of not a finished module that I could explain easily in one sentence. So I'm halfway through changing from one type of regression to another type of regression and it's only halfway there. And so 
the commit message would be something like halfway through doing this thing. And like, to me, that feels like not very useful. I can't, I can't imagine wanting to jump back in time to being halfway through a big change. Um, at the same time, committing, on the other hand, committing not often enough would be, I think if it's too hard to summarize in one pithy sentence, what I did. So like, I changed from one regression to another and I updated the readme file and I changed the way this composite variable was calculated. That's that's like too many different things. And when I imagine myself looking at the difference between files, I would say, was this change related to the regression thing or the composite variable thing? I don't know because I was doing multiple conceptually distinct things. That's kind of my heuristic, but yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you have something different? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really good. Like I usually think about it as like, you know, is, am I at a point where I would like to be able to get back to in the future? Mm -hmm. um, another question, well, actually Brandon has a question in the, the Q and A. Um, I don't know if you want to read that one aloud. And... Sure. For reproducibility, would you recommend that people deploy and provide Docker images directly for people to pull down and use or provide the code through a controlled virtual computing environment like CodeOcean or both? Interesting. Um, so I actually do not use either of these tools very much myself. Um, I have kind of a different workflow for reproducible manuscript writing that is more built on R with the RN of package and uh, LaTeX for piping results into the manuscript. So I actually have not really used either of these all that much. Um, Russ, is this something that you feel you would yeah, want to yeah, comment on? Yeah. Um, so I generally, I mean, I think it's nice to actually provide both a Docker image to rerun things exactly and you know access to a virtual environment. Um, my concern about only providing access through a virtual environment is, you know, so. CodeOcean could go out of business next month and then suddenly people don't have access to that environment um, or they decide they want to start charging. And so that's my main concern about, you know, about those things. So I think you have to think about like who, which environment you're, you're using. But I think in principle, it's nice to have, it's nice to provide access to both. Another question is along with when to commit, how specific should the commit be? Uh, when writing a larger package? For example, do you commit by each modular script or all changes of working across scripts? That's a cool question. I like how it brings like multiple principles together. Um, so for me, I think of the commits not in terms of which script is being altered, but in terms of what conceptual work is being done. So for example, sometimes a what feels like a single um, module of work to me actually occupies changes to multiple scripts. So an example would be something like, um, I want to do a new analysis that involves um, treating a variable, a variable as categorical rather than continuous. Well, I need to edit my data prep script because I need to make the categorical variable in the first place. And I need to edit my analysis script because I need to fit a different kind of model for that categorical variable. Um, that could be two different commits, right? It could be like one commit is make the variable in the prep script. One commit could be do the analysis. Um, sometimes if it's a relatively small change, I'll just do a single commit, which is like add analysis for this new categorical variable. And that commit will have you know two files that have been edited. It's also useful to modularize the files then because I know that whatever changes happen in the data prep file are obviously about data prep. Um, so there's no like mixing of data prep and analysis in the same place. Um, another question for you is, um, do you use Git branches in your workflow? I do, yeah. Um, I, I live with a constant fear of kind of like trying to make something more elegant or simpler and just like destroying it completely. Um, so Git branches, for those who haven't heard of these, are um, uh, basically making like a parallel universe of your script that you're working on where... Um, you are sort of making a parallel history and you can do whatever you want and kind of have it as like a sandbox or something and you're working on this other branch and if it if you like what you're doing you can then kind of merge it back onto the what's called the main branch the central branch um, or if it like just doesn't work and it breaks then you could actually just get rid of that branch and have the main one be unaffected so it's a nice way to to um test things out that might cause problems. In software development, it's used often if there's like a feature that's being introduced, but it might totally screw things up. So you don't wanna just edit the main branch. Um, 
so I, I actually do use them a lot. Um, yeah, especially in the context of kind of making big changes that I feel like uh, make me nervous or really useful for collaboration um, where, you know, maybe I want to kind of suggest something to someone, but I don't want to just like overwrite what they did. Um, even though it will be in the diff, I can make another branch and then they can, it makes it a little bit easier for someone to kind of see and maybe reject uh, changes that you've made. Yeah, I found it really to free me up to try things in a way mm -hmm. that uh, that that's really nice um but it but there is overhead in terms of like you know look, well particularly in generally a problem i feel like you know to the degree that things go wrong and get it usually has to do with merging right? you know <laughs> yeah. you have one change you're trying to merge in another and suddenly you get this failure and there's all these like weird error messages absolutely and can't figure out how to get <laughs> things back fortunately you know usually stack overflow will have someone who's encountered exactly the same problem in the past and you can mm -hmm. kind of find out how to do it. But that is that is the challenge there. Um, does anybody else have any questions? It uh, looks like uh, we're done with questions. So uh, why don't we uh, thank Maya? This is a great talk and and really, uh, really great discussion. So, um, so we'll see you all next week then, uh, next Thursday, 3 p.m. Pacific for the uh, for the practical session. And um, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the great questions till next week.